students, faculty, we are continuing with our 2022 Chemistry Senior Experience Seminar Series. And Matthew Piper is going to be joining us next, introduced by Graham Sazima. Hello, everybody. Good to see you all again today. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Matt Piper for his senior experience talk. Uh, Matt and I have been on a journey together here at Lawrence. Uh, our first exposure to one another was actually my first year studies class. That might have been the first time I taught that class, too. So, um, And then 116 together, and then inorganic. He's now in my advanced inorganic class. So Matt has spent a lot of time with me, probably more than he would like, uh, although he hasn't made that uh, at all known to me. So uh, Matt's very calm, cool, collected guy. And so uh, we got to talking about doing research, and I said, Matt, how do you feel about the independent part of independent study? And he said, I feel good about that, because he feels good about most things, it seems like. And so I was like, OK, go figure out how to do this thing. <laughs> and uh, he basically did. So everything he's going to tell you about today largely uh, came out of his efforts um, with me just occasionally chatting with him and giving him a little bit of direction, maybe, although you know most of this was, was all Matt. So um, I'm excited to see what he has to tell us all. And uh, with that, the floor is yours, Matt. Actually, I should say, please join me in, in welcoming Matt. All right. Thank you. All right, hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking uh, about metal organic frameworks, or MOFs for short. I had the opportunity to work with Graham over the summer and winter breaks this past year uh, to work on this project, uh, primarily investigating the diffusion of organic solutions uh, into MOFs. So to pro provide a little background, um, the field of metal organic frameworks is a, a really relatively recent field uh, in, in the realm of chemistry. Uh, the earliest reported MOF was, was in 1995 by the Omar Yagi Research Group. And since then, the field has become uh, widely popular with dozens of new papers on MOFs coming out each year. Um, now, some of the things that uh, researchers are in interested in, uh, they're interested in looking at how these highly porous materials can work within adsorbent systems. And a lot of the research that they are doing is motivated by the capacity of MOFs to adsorb gases such as hydrogen, methane, and CO2. And for these reasons, uh, metal organic frameworks are seen as potential candidates for energy and environmental applications. Now, while the uh, research on MOFs has really been focused on gas phase chemistry, uh, Graham and I were interested in looking at how MOFs can be used in solution phase interactions, and, and that's what uh, this presentation is going to be about today. Um, so there, are, we had about four main goals that we wanted to accomplish. The first, of course, being uh, the synthesis and characterization of MOF materials. We can't um, study them if we haven't made them yet. So that's, that's where this presentation will start. Um, and once we had a uh, reproducible synthesis, uh, we found it important to look at the ways that the particle size of our samples were being impacted by the sample preparation that we were doing. And the motivation behind this was that the particle sizes uh, we theorized would have a um, correlation to the amount of diffusion that the MOF materials were able to accomplish. Um, now beyond that, our, our primary goal um, was, was to look at if it was possible for a metal organic framework to absorb an organic radical solution. Um, and we were successful in achieving this goal. Um, and to take it a step further, one thing in the future that we want to look at is seeing if we can use the same spectroscopic methods that you'll see in this presentation to determine the rate of diffusion um, for organic solutions. So to start, I want to take you through the synthesis and characterization of metal organic frameworks. Now, the general overview for a MOF synthesis, uh, MOFs are um, this class of compounds that consist of metal ion clusters uh, connected to organic linker molecules through, through coronation bonds. And this forms a highly regular, highly porous coronation polymer um, that extends in three dimensions. Uh, and you can see from this representation uh, the 
large amount of regular pores within the mineral organic framework. And these pores are what give moths their high surface area, uh, which, is, which is what makes them highly adsorbent materials. The first moth that I attempted to synthesize was Moth 5. This is one of the first uh, published stable moths. Uh, it was published in 1999, and it seemed like a good place to start. Uh, so the metal ion clusters in this particular metal organic framework are zinc 2, uh, which comes from this zinc nitrate reagent. Uh, and we combine that with our organic linker molecule, which is this bicarboxylic acid. Uh, and we do what is called exoluble thermal synthesis. So this is one step uh, and one reaction vessel. So we combine our reagents in a vessel of uh, dimethylformamid and we heat the reaction. Um, and that is what uh, is, what, well, that's what is driving the reaction towards our product. Um, shown here, this is just the single unit cell for Ma5. This gets extended in, um, three dimensions, and I'll show you what that looks like uh, soon here. Uh, but first I wanna look, take a look at what is happening mechanistically with this type of reaction. Um, so as we're heating the solvent, as we're heating DMF, uh, it's going to uh, eliminate carbon monoxide, and that's going to cause DMF to decompose into dimethylamine, which can act as a Lewis base to deprotonate the carboxylic acids on our organic linker molecule. Uh, once the carboxylic acids have been deprotonated to uh, carboxylate groups. Coronation bonds between the zinc ions and the organic linker molecules are able to form, and that is what drives the reaction towards our product. And when that, this unit cell gets repeated, uh, right, so this uh, reaction actually happens quite slowly, and that is um, going to mean that our base gets added slowly to our reaction. This promotes quality crystal growth. Uh, and when these single unit cell crystals uh, are repeated in three dimensions, uh, we, get, um, we get this uh, cubic structure of MOF5, and this is, this is more in line with what, um, what MOF5 actually looks like. You can see uh, this sort of regular cubic pore uh, into which uh, gas molecules can diffuse, uh, and this, is, this gets repeated in three dimension. Um, so we have to characterize our product once we've uh, completed a synthesis to make sure that what we are aiming to make ends up being what we actually made. And um, the most common way for doing this is through powder x-ray diffraction. Um, and that is the method that we chose to use. Um, and it appears there was some uh, mix up between converting the presentation from my Mac uh, onto the PC here. Uh, but this is supposed to be a schematic of what is happening inside the instrument for powder x-ray. Um, so it involves pointing a x-ray tube at the sample, uh, and that is going to cause the atoms within the sample to absorb the x-ray and then emit them uh, towards the detector. And in a crystalline sample, the atoms are evenly uh, divided by distances uh, labeled as D. Uh, so each atom in the molecule is going to absorb some of the beam. That's going to split the beam up into different diffracted beams uh, that are running parallel to each other, and each of those diffracted beams get, um, each of those diffracted beams are separated by a distance of uh, equal to the distance between the atoms. So in the course of an X-ray diffraction experiment, we are scanning through a range of um, angles made between the incident beam and the sample. So that's going to change the angle theta, um, and that's going to change the amount of interference that we see between the diffracted beams. So um, once the beams have been diffracted into parallel beams based on the distance between the atoms, um, the angle between the incident beam and the sample is going to cause the path length of the beams to change. And if the path length changes by a uh, value, uh, an integer value of the wavelength, then we end up with constructive interference. And this is, in this instance, we get our um, most intense signal. Uh, now the opposite of that is when the angle is such that the beams have a path length that differs by one half 
integer values of the wavelength. This causes disruptive interference. So the waves collide and destroy each other, and uh, as a result, no signal can be seen at these angles. So uh, depending on the angle of the incident beam, uh, we get these diffracted patterns that lie somewhere on a continuum between constructive interference and destructive interference. Uh, and we can use uh, Bragg's law to predict where constructive interference is going to occur. Uh, so in this equation, n is a full value integer. Uh, lambda is the wavelength of the x-ray. Uh, D is the distance between the atoms. And theta is the angle of incident beams. Um, so in the case where we know the wavelength of our, um, of the x-ray because it's part of the instrumental parameters and we know the angle of incidence because that is the independent variable that we're changing. Um, so we can solve for using the x-ray diffraction pattern, we can solve for the distance between the atoms and learn more about the crystalline structure of the compound. Now, in this research, we don't go quite that far. and Instead, we use diffraction patterns to compare to one another um, and, and just look for where the peaks are lining up. So here is a figure that shows two of our solvable thermal MOF5 syntheses. Um, and you can see that the peaks here line up very well along the x-axis. Um, and that is to say that these compounds have a very similar crystal structure and thus the synthesis is reproducible. However, once we compared it to um, this pattern shown in red, which we found in the literature, uh, we noticed that the, um, the synthesis patterns don't line up with what we would expect from MOF5. Uh, so while the synthesis is reproducible, it must be something else that uh, we arrived at. Uh, and looking further, uh, we compared it to a pattern for MOF69C. And what you'll find is that all of the major peaks here line up almost exactly. Um, so while the synthesis was reproducible, we were producing MOF 69C rather than MOF 5. And what is happening uh, to cause that is that it turns out MOF 5 is sensitive enough to water that the water vapor in the atmosphere is causing it to decompose. So in this figure, you'll see um, four different X-ray diffraction patterns. Um, all in theory MOF5. Um, so in less than one minute, at the bottom there, you'll see an X-ray diffraction pattern for MOF5, and you'll see the peak at 10 is characteristic for MOF5. And as early as 10 minutes, and when exposed to the atmosphere, uh, this peak at 8.9 degrees starts to emerge. And that peak is characteristic of the decomposition from MOF5 to MOF69C. And we can conclude from this figure that within 24 hours, a sample of MOF5 completely decomposes to MOF69C when exposed to the atmosphere. So that meant that the synthetic conditions that I was working under needed to change. Uh, we needed to minimize the amount of exposure to moisture and the atmosphere uh, as much as we could. And what that looked like on the synthetic side of things meant working in the glove box. The glove box is a piece of equipment that is filled with dinitrogen gas. Um, so working our synthesis in the glove box meant that there was no exposure to moisture or oxygen um, or atmospheric air of any kind. Uh, what was more difficult was working on the characterization side of things because the instrument for our X-ray diffraction experiments wasn't capable of performing air-free experiments. So in order to minimize exposure, uh, what we did was we placed a layer of Kapton tape over the sample tray. Um, Kapton tape is this sort of orange tape that you'll see, uh, and it is highly resistant to x-rays. So we theorized that uh, it would allow the x-rays to pass through, through the tape uh, so that the MOF5 sample could, could absorb and diffract the x-ray beams. But when we ran this through the x-ray diffraction experiments, what we found was that it didn't appear that the um, tape was allowing the x-ray to pass through. It looked like the tape was absorbing the x-ray. And that can be seen in the top left figure and the bottom figure. Uh, you'll notice that all of the peaks that would indicate crystallinity are absent from those two patterns, uh, meaning that none of the x-ray was reaching our MOF5 sample. Uh, 
Uh, if you look at the top right figure, however, you can see that the peak at 8.9 degrees is significantly diminished compared to our other samples, and the peak at 10 uh, remains visible. Uh, so I think there was some merit to the method that we were doing. It seems like based on this pattern, uh, we may have succeeded in, in our synthesis of MOF5, um, but the data was just a little bit too messy to draw decisive conclusions from. So we moved on to a different metal organic framework, um, this one being called HCUS1. HCUS1 uses a uh, copper two ion cluster rather than zinc, uh, and instead of the dicarboxylic acid group, uh, it's a tricarboxylic acid uh, compound that we're using. Uh, in addition, the solvent that we're using is a little bit different. Instead of just DMF, now it's an equal part mixture of water, ethanol, and DMF. But the uh, mechanism is largely the same. This is still a soluble thermal synthesis. So due to the heat, um, one of these solvents is decomposing into a base that allows um, the carboxylic acids to deprotonate and form coronation bonds with the copper ions. And this synthesis led to some really pretty turquoise polycrystalline uh, samples. And when we, um, when we did our X-ray diffraction experiments, uh, comparing it to this uh, pattern found in the literature, uh, our, our synthesis is shown in red here. Uh, you'll notice all of the major peaks line up along the X-axis. So we were quickly able to identify this as a successful synthesis of HCUS1. So we've completed our first goal of synthesizing and characterizing a metal organic framework sample. And now it was time to look at how uh, our preparations of the sample would impact particle size. And again, this uh, was largely, largely because um, the particle size may have some influence on the pore size, and that's going to impact how much diffusion of guest molecules our samples are able to accomplish. So consider for a second these two different kinds of sponges, uh, the top one being more like a cleaning sponge, has larger pores than, pores than the uh, bottom one, uh, which happens to be a, a drywall sponge. Um, and because of the difference in the size of the pores, you can imagine these sponges holding significantly different amounts of water. Similarly, uh, in our MOF samples, uh, based on the size of the pores, larger pores are going to cause more diffusion, smaller pores are going to cause less diffusion. So we started by looking at the uh, crystalline level, um, taking a look at our crystallite size before the particle size. Uh, so we started with our baseline, this as synthesized sample, which is to say we've done no, uh, no preparations to it after the synthesis, and we compared it to a pattern that was of a sample that had been powdered after the synthesis was complete. And you'll notice these uh, diffraction patterns are very similar, so there is no significant deviation in the crystalline structure of these two samples. Similarly, we, take, we took a look at a, um, we took our as synthesized sample, um, which had not yet been washed with solvent, and we compared it to a different sample that we did wash with our solvent to eliminate any unreacted species, um, and again, this had no significant impact on the size of the crystallites. Uh, lastly, uh, we, you'll notice the washing method for this one was sonication, which involves uh, emitting sonic waves at a sample tube full of our sample. That seemed like it might be a little aggressive, might be breaking up some of the aggregates, um, so we wanted to compare samples that were washed by sonication and samples that were washed using a stir bar. And again, there were no um, significant differences at the crystalline level uh, of these two samples. So next we wanted to zoom out a little bit and look at the particle size. Uh, now the particles, when we looked at the scanning electron microscopy images, ended up being these sort of large aggregates of the crystallites, which isn't too surprising based on the fact that this is a polycrystalline material. Um, but it made it very difficult to determine a uh, uniform particle size between, uh, between the different sample preparations. Um, so what we can see from this set of images, you can see the scale bar here, um, and when analyzing these Im images, we determined that the particle size ranges from three to 18 microns. Um, so the particle size, while not uniform, um, 
we knew from our powder X-ray diffraction data that crystallite sizes were. Uh, those only range from 26 to 33 nanometers. Um, and you know, the scale of these images being on the micrometer scale, um, they are, the particles are, are two to three orders of magnitude larger than the crystallite size. So we have hundreds or thousands of crystallites making up each particle. Um, so that crystallinity, again, was confirmed by the narrow peaks of the powder X-ray diffraction pattern. And since there was such a um, narrow range on those uh, X-ray diffraction patterns, and since there was a narrow range on the crystallite size, uh, we assumed that based on the crystalline level of our sample, that the pore size was actually not changing all that much. Um, so we were able to move on from this step and begin looking at the, um, the adsorption of an organic solution, specifically an organic radical solution. Uh, so our method for this involved dissolving a stable organic radical in, uh, in an organic, organic solvent, um, and then that radical becomes a indicator uh, for the absorption because we are going to use electron paraprenic resonance spectroscopy uh, to, to detect that radical. So the radical that we chose was the stable radical. Uh, it goes by the name of Tempo. Uh, so we made a uh, solution of Tempo in toluene uh, and then immersed our MOF samples into the solution. Uh, those were left overnight and when it was time to separate the solids from the solution, uh, we dried them using vacuum filtration and then washed the exterior with toluene. This ensured that um, there was no tempo solution remaining on the outside of the MOF, and any tempo that uh, appears in the EPR spectrum is solely the tempo solution that had been adsorbed into the pores of the metal organic framework. And again, just to reiterate, uh, our method is using electron paramagnetic resonance to determine if, um, if this te tempo radical shows up. Uh, and that can, that can confirm our adsorption of the organic solution. We were able to accomplish that, and once we did, we thought to take it a step further and take a look at the kinetics of diffusion briefly. Um, so that involved varying the time at which the moth was immersed in the tempo solution, um, and then you, we were able to use a specific technique in EPR to calculate the concentration of tempo, and we theorized that um, there would be some sort of relationship between the time at which MOF was allowed to soak and concentration that had been absorbed. So in short, the way that EPR works is that it detects paramagnetic species. And uh, these figures might look familiar to some of you uh, as our, our D orbital filling diagrams. Uh, so if you remember your orbital filling rules, first we go along the lowest energy orbitals and filling degenerate orbitals first, all with spin up electrons. So uh, let's imagine a D6 compound. So first we would fill one, two, three along the um, lowest energy so that they're all half fold and then, and then we would go back and uh, fill them with the rest of our electrons as spin down and then four, five, six. So notice how each orbital has both a spin up and a spin down electron. These get denoted as m sub s equals plus one half and minus one half. Uh, and since each electron is paired, this species is called diamagnetic, which means the electronic spin is s equals zero. Now imagine a D9 compound. Uh, we, we go by the same rules, so we fill our bottom orbitals, one, two, three, four, five, six, and now we jump up to the next energy level, uh, filling half full first, uh, seven, eight, and then our ninth electron uh, is there. And notice that there is one orbital here that is only half full with a spin up electron. This is an example of a paramagnetic compound. In this case, the uh, electronic spin for such a species is S equals one half. Um, and it's important to note that in the absence of a magnetic field, uh, spin up and spin down are degenerate states. That means they have the same energy. However, once we apply a magnetic field, these energy states uh, get split, and the uh, energy difference between the two states is equal to this equation here, where 
the G value and the Bohr magneton are constant values. So the difference in energy is only a function of uh, the applied field strength, so long as our sample is, is the same. Um, so in an EPR experiment, uh, our aim is to sweep through a range of magnetic field strengths, uh, changing H here, and thus changing the difference between the two energy states. Meanwhile, there is a microwave bridge that is emitting photons within the microwave frequency, uh, frequency here being denoted as, as nu, um, and that frequency over the course of an experiment is not changing, uh, so the energy of the photon is also constant. So as we're sweeping through a range of field strength, we are searching for uh, the, the field strength where the energy of the photon and the difference in energy between the electronic states is equal. And this is known as our resonance condition. Uh, and it is within this resonance condition that we can observe the transition between the two spin states. And that's going to lead to the uh, spectra that I'm going to show you in a second here. Uh, now beyond this splitting based on the magnetic field, that is the, the major energy split between the two spin states. But the splitting can be divided even further based on hyperfine coupling between the electronic state and the nucleus state. Um, so, due to the interaction between electronic spin and nuclear spin, uh, we can get even more energy levels. And based on our selection rules, in the case of I equals one half, we would see two transitions in this instance. And if I equals one, there would be three transitions. If I equals three halves, there would be four. Uh, and that pattern goes on as, as uh, I increases. So first, we wanted to look at um, the spectrum that we got from the room temperature solution of, of tempo in toluene. Uh, and you'll notice here, um, despite this being a, a spectroscopic method, this doesn't look quite like an, absorbance, an absorption spectrum. Um, and that is because data from the EPR is actually uh, reported as the first derivative of absorption rather than absorption itself. Uh, so this, though it looks a little weird, is actually analogous to a triplet NMR spectrum. And that is because the radical within tempo is this nitroxide radical. So it's localized on this NO bond. Uh, and since nitrogen has a nuclear spin state of I equals one, that means due to the hyperfine coupling, uh, we see a, a triplet state and our spectrum is split into three peaks. Um, next, we want to see the um, interaction, uh, the spectrum for HCUS1 in EPR, and it turns out that HCUS1 is EPR active. Um, and if you remember back to the synthesis uh, slides, from earlier in the presentation, you remember that I said HCUS1 contains copper two ions. If you look at where copper is on the periodic table, you'll see that copper is a group 11 element. That means that it has 11 total valence electrons. You take away two to create copper two, and you end up with nine. Uh, and just like the D9 example that I showed you at the start of, of this section, um, HCUS1 ends up being a D9 complex. Um, and, and has an EPR active spectrum. Next, I want to point out just how much broader this HCUS1 spectrum is compared to the um, organic radical spectrum. Uh, you'll notice there's, there's actually some overlap between the two, uh, two spectra here, uh, and, and tempo just ends up being this really small sliver compared to HCUS1. So zooming in, you can, you can still see the uh, triplet peaks, uh, even though, even though the, the scale is much wider. So we hypothesized that the um, spectrum for the HCUS1 sample soaked in tempo solution would appear as some sort of combination between these two individual spectra, and that is what we ended up seeing. Um, while there is some, some noise in this spectrum, you can, in fact, see that there is still this HCUS1 uh, signal right next to the tempo signal. And you can even notice that the tempo 
peaks are sloping downwards uh, now as a result of the overlap between the HCUST1 and the tempo signals, um, whereas on its own tempo was, was pretty much even in intensity across, across the field sweep. Um, right, so this was very exciting. This was the proof that we needed to show that uh, HCUST1 was capable of adsorbing organic solutions, or at least toluene. Um, so since we're able to see the organic radical tempo, that means HCUST1 must be adsorbing um, or, or adsorbing the organic radical solution. Uh, so one thing that, that might lead to future research is just looking at other metal organic framework and seeing if they are also capable of this type of behavior. Now in, in the course of my research with Graham, uh, one step further that we wanted to take was looking to see if we could determine a rate of diffusion. Um, so that involved calculating the concentration of tempo that has been uh, adsorbed by the moth uh, using quantitative EPR techniques. Uh, so this involves taking the second integral of this spectrum, which is very similar to integrating under the absorption peak of, of proton NMR to determine how many hydrogens are making up that peak. Uh, but in the case of EPR, this technique tells us how many electronic spins are contributing to the signal. Um, so we did that for uh, HCUST1 samples that had been immersed in tempo solution for various amounts of time, uh, and we got this data. And this data shows that we weren't able to accomplish um, any, any relationship between time and concentration uh, based on this method, uh, not at this time at least. Um, so therefore, we were unable to determine the rate of diffusion for organic solutions into HCUST1 at this time. But we were still able to achieve our other goals and our primary goal of um, confirming the adsorption of organic radical solutions by a metal organic framework. Um, yeah, the rate of diffusion for this adsorption has yet to be determined and will remain a goal for the future of this research. And um, yeah, I just want to take a look at some of the uh, obstacles that uh, cause this little roadblock um, with my time on this project. Uh, and one of them is this interference between the HCUS1 signal and the tempo signal. Again, the, um, the MOV had a much broader uh, signal compared to the organic radical, uh, and that caused some overlap between the two um, so that they, um, they sort of interfered with each other. Uh, the next one is what I will call the, the sort of anisotropic effect. Um, so recall that the difference in energy between um, the two electronic states is given by this equation. Um, G, the G value is an important part of this equation. Um, and it turns out that the G value is dependent on the radical's orientation to the magnetic field. Now in solution, the radical is able to tumble rapidly and quickly so that we can observe all orientations of the radical uh, in reference to the magnetic field. And as a result, the average value of the G value is observed. However, when tempo is absorbed by the moth, it is possible that only a specific orientation or orientations can be observed. And that's going to change our signal. Um, and if the orientation or the change in orientation is not consistent between all of our samples, that's going to be really difficult to account for. Um, so some solutions that we can uh, try for these two problems. Uh, for one, to tackle the first one, if we can find an EPR silent moth that is air stable, um, we don't have to worry about the two signals overlapping with each other. Um, and secondly, for the anisotropic effect, uh, it's possible that computational fitting may offer a solution. Uh, so this involves using a, um, a software to model the spectra, uh, and, and from that model, we might be able to subtract out some of the, um, some of the effects of anisotropy in our sample, and that's going to allow us to account for the effect. Um, but yeah, uh, so this, these are the goals for the future of, of this project. 
I'm excited to see where it goes uh, with RAM and future students. Uh, I want to end with, with some thank yous. Uh, first, I want to thank RAM uh, for his guidance as both my uh, research advisor and academic advisor, Dr. Rachel Dowdy, uh, for her feedback while putting this presentation together, uh, as well as help collecting the scanning electron microscopy images, uh, Daniel Martin, and the student workers in the chemistry stockroom uh, for their assistance on this project, Dr. Todd Kostman at UW Oshkosh for his help getting the SEM images, uh, Dr. Stoyilovich at UW Oshkosh for his help getting the, um, the X-ray diffraction data, uh, my colleagues in the synthetic research group, uh, namely M. Harper, Carmen Magistro, and Ezra Marker, uh, all of my classmates in Chem 680, and lastly, Lawrence University for providing funding for this research. Thank you for listening, and I'll now be taking any questions. Okay, friends, Matthew would be happy to take your questions. Please raise your hand. M? Um, I have a question more broadly about the adsorption of solutions into MOS structures. Is it at all possible to then uh, empty the pores of those solutions, or would you have to use a new, like, dry sample for each experiment that you would want to do with those MOS? I'm not sure if you know the yeah. Um, I think I think that would require a little bit more research. Um, one way that I think it would be possible is uh, using like a vacuum oven. You might be able to evaporate the organic solution from the pores. Um, but if your goal is to retain the solution, then I, I'm not sure what, what method you would try to go by. There, there is some precedent for emptying out the pores by successive washing of very tedious and time consuming. It's possible. Future work on Isaac <laughs> Other questions for Matthew? Yes, Allison? Um, oh, so many questions about the diffusion. So, um, the, how are you measuring your concentrations? Um, that you the, the last plot that you said didn't mm -hmm. work that well. Um, how are you getting those concentrations? Yeah, that's through um, a, a technique. Uh, a, a quantitative APR technique called spin counting. Okay. Um, so by taking the second integration of the spectrum, um, we get sort of the, the integral under, under the absorption peak. Uh, and I don't know exactly what, what calculation goes on, but yeah. um, from sort of the, the size of the sample tube and the weight and, and the, um, the spin number, of the sample, uh, the, uh, the software is able to calculate the concentration uh, based on the number of spins that are present. And that was a time-dependent measurement. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was on my own end. Uh, I just set up different samples um, and allowed them to soak in the solution for different amounts of time. Um, oh, okay. And, and just ran those through the EPR. Okay, cool. We'll chat later. That's all. Okay. Lots, lots of thoughts, lots of thoughts. Uh, James? Uh, I get that there's no trend between the time and the, like the concentration that the H, like the molecule that been observed, uh, absorbed. Uh, I was wondering if you have like the variable, like the amount of the solution that they, like you guys tried, so that if there's any trend between the amount of the solution and the amount absorbed. Yeah. Um I, I had made sure to use the same solution and um, kept the volume of solution constant um, across experiments, but it is possible that maybe based on um, the mass of, of mineral organic framework material that I use that maybe the, the concentration is changing. Chris. Hi. Uh, I have a question about what's so special about your carboxylic acids? Can you change that with like something a little bit similar like would that work? Yeah, um, there is precedent for um, using, um, usually not changing the carboxylic group itself, but adding an amine 
to um, one of the other carbons on the benzene ring, it's possible to make a MOF that way. Um, and then you have sort of this MOF amino complex. Um, yeah. I have a question. What does an EPR uh, silence, what does that look like? Does that just mean the metal is diamagnetic? Yeah, it's just a diamagnetic species, um, pretty much just noise um, in the spectrum. So are most MOFs made of paramagnetic materials or diamagnetic? Do you have any idea of sort of like what other MOFs look like that have been synthesized so far? Sure, yeah, there's a lot of zinc um, in, in metal organic framework chemistry um, and those end up being um, diamagnetic usually um, as long as they're zinc two and not zinc three. Uh, otherwise I've seen zirconium, which I don't, it's group four. I don't know what oxidation state most of those are um, it's the, the sure, okay. So yeah, those would be diamagnetic too, and, and also EPR silent. So what you're saying is the chances of finding an EPR silent one is good. Yeah, um, I think uh, the air stable part might be more of a challenge, and, and more importantly, an air stable MOF that doesn't require some crazy intense synthesis that's gonna end up being expensive or, or, or something. Yeah. All good considerations, yes. <laughs> Other questions for our speaker? All right, if not, let's thank our speaker again. Join us Wednesday and Friday for even more of this good stuff. Thanks for coming.